Well, it was a, a Thursday night, and a, a buddy of mine was hosting weekly trivia at the place with the best steak kebabs in St. Louis. Each week, he does his research, and he puts the game together, shows up, sets up, and he boosts a local bar's turnout and profits as dozens of patrons come out to play trivia. Some teams will do well, and they'll come home with a prize. Most will just enjoy the camaraderie of uh, playing together, and yet everybody will come away having learned something new. Now, honestly, a lot of the, the, the questions, answers, uh, like which one movie featured the lead actors from these three movies can seem kind of trivial. That's why they call it trivia. But, but every now and then, an answer would actually cause a pause, an audible, huh, eyebrows might raise. Mouths might fall just a little bit more open when an unexpected answer actually causes people to pause and think. Maybe saying, I guess so, I, I hadn't really thought about that before. Eventually, and yet perhaps surprised that they not only learn something about the world they live in, but actually learn something about themselves. And so I thought if my buddy were to simply ask, what's the most common command in the Bible? What kind of answers would be turned in? Maybe some answer with what they consider the most significant ones, like do not murder, or messages they heard in youth group growing up, like do not commit adultery, or ones that most are often echoed by their culture, like do not judge. And I wonder how surprised they might be when my buddy reveals the answer. Would any eyebrows be raised? Would any mouths fall just a little bit more open when they hear that no fewer than 70 times in the Bible we find the command, do not be afraid. Or to surprise them as much as it surprised me when I first heard it. What is it about fear that impacts us so much that the most common command in the Bible would have to be, do not be afraid? So this morning we're going to look at a, a verse in the Bible that clarifies why God keeps saying the same thing over and over again by showing us why we need God to speak to our fear. It's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 25. In your pew Bible, it's right there on page 1029. It says this, Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. One verse. And yet if this is a verse to help us understand why God needs to address our fear so often, then there's three things we need to understand about what it here calls the fear of man. What it is, what it does, and how we can be free from it. Three things, so let's go. What is this fear that this passage is talking about? And that's an important question because not everything that's called fear is necessarily a bad thing. There's the kind of fear that makes you lock your doors at night or, or put on a seatbelt or run background checks on volunteers or buy a life insurance policy in a book that often speaks in categorical terms like the wise and the foolish and often uses the term man as short for mankind or, or human. One type of person Proverbs often commends is the prudent man. Proverbs 22.3 says, a prudent man sees danger and takes refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. And so we know that the fear of man here isn't talking about fear experienced by man, experienced by humanity in general, because that's not always a bad thing. What this verse is talking about isn't people's fear in general, but a kind of fear of people. And that's really significant in a book that talks a lot about wisdom and says wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, something that scholars have defined as, as reverent awe and a healthy fear of God's displeasure and discipline, something Proverbs actually describes as a fountain of life. When that kind of awe and fear of someone's displeasure with a, a hope that pleasing them will grant us life is not directed towards a holy God, but towards sinful people, that's the fear of man. And as a result, what they might think of you begins to control you. That's what the fear of man is. And it, it's pervasive. It is, it is everywhere, even where you would least expect it. Um, for example, in the world of sports, 
athletes are always taking risks. They're always looking for an edge, always looking for better ways to do something, and then often imitating those who have found success. And so when Rick Barry, who's the only basketball player to be the leading scorer in the NCAA, that's college ball, the ABA and the NBA professional leagues showed that there was a better way to shoot free throws. You'd expect everyone to be imitating him. I mean, after all, every player has to shoot free throws. And when Barry retired, he was the most accurate free throw shooter in the history of two professional leagues. As Barry said, from the physics standpoint, it's a much better way to shoot. Less things that can go wrong, less things that you have to worry about repeating properly in order for it to be successful. In 2008, when Discover Magazine asked a physics professor, he agreed. The 45-degree arc angle and the natural backspin both increase the odds of the, of the ball going in the net relative to the more common method. So you might think this technique would be imitated by everybody from the pros all the way down to kids on the playground, and you would be wrong. Barry's free throw shooting style was underhanded, what's often called granny style. And even when a professional athlete does it, let me tell you, it does not look cool. It is not a good look. And so when asked why his shooting style never took among other players, Barry said, players are too embarrassed. The power of social norms is just too strong. We might call it peer pressure today. The Bible calls it the fear of man. But it can have a lot more faces than just that. You see, sometimes the fear of man looks like our people-pleasing, where we can't say no or be honest about hard things, even when we know we, we really should be, not feeling the freedom to be open, not wanting to risk letting people down, letting them know what we really think, how we really feel. Sometimes it looks like a constant concern about how we look, how much we weigh, how we're dressed. It can look like an addiction to others' approval, always craving compliments, being easily embarrassed, always making excuses for your bad behavior so people won't think you're a bad person, or shifting blame because we can't stand the thought of failing people. It can look like constantly comparing ourselves with others, feeling good when we win and envious when we lose and another wins or get something that we don't get. Fear of man can look very timid or weak, but it can also look very bold and, and, and strong, asserting ourselves in front of others, even aggressively while secretly terrified that we'll be exposed as an imposter. That's what lies behind the story of an, of an old preacher who once wrote in his sermon notes, point is weak, pound pulpit harder, as if his physical act of strength could somehow hide the weakness that he hoped nobody else would notice. It's what often underlies people engagement in what are often called the culture wars, where someone might boldly denounce an entire group or the culture as a whole, being quite militant in their engagement, often posting internet memes about how weak and how foolish their adversaries are, often appearing very angry. But any psychologist will tell you anger is just a secondary emotion, often masking the fear of the very people that they look down upon. The fear of man is pervasive, and even when we think we're over it, it can come right back in a different form. For example, on the a Church of Facebook blog, Jesse Rice writes a fictional breakup letter to fear of what other people think. He writes, Dear fear of what others think, I am sick of you, and it's time we broke up. I know we've broken up and gotten back together many times, but seriously, fear of what others think, this is it. We are breaking up. We are never, ever getting back together. Okay, that may have been Taylor Swift. Um, I am tired of overthinking my status updates on Facebook, trying to sound more clever, funny, and important. I am sick of feeling anxious about what I say or do in public, especially around people I don't know that well, all in the hope that they'll like me, accept me, praise me. I run around all day feeling like a golden retriever with a full bladder. Like me, like me, like me. Because of you, I go through my day with a cloud of shame hanging over my head. And I never stop acting. 
the spotlight's always on, and I am center stage, and I'd better keep dancing, posturing, mugging, or else the spotlight will move, and I'll dissolve into a little meaningless puddle on the ground, just like that witch in The Wizard of Oz. I can never live up to the expectations of my imaginary audience, the one that lives in my head, but whose collective voice is louder than any other voice in the universe. He concludes, so eat it, fear of what others think. You and I are done, and no, I am not interested in talking it through. I am running, jumping, laughing you out of my life once and for all. Or at least that's what I really, really want. God, help me. The fear of man is powerful, and yet it's not just the fear of what others might think, but what they might do, and the people of God are not immune to it. You see, long before these Proverbs were written, um, some 4,000 years ago, God called a guy named Abraham to himself and made him ironclad promises, promises that essentially made him and his wife bulletproof until sometime after they became parents. Despite that, a still childless Abraham came into a new land. He so feared that the king would find his wife so beautiful that he would kill Abraham to have her for his own wife. So he deliberately misled him, saying she was only his sister. Then when he came into a new land with a new king, he did it again. A generation later, his son Isaac did just like dad and did the same lie about his wife. When their descendants, the Israelites, saw the land that God literally promised them, that's why it's called the promised land, they so feared the people in that land that they tried going back to the land of their former captivity and the people that once enslaved them. And yet, in that picture, we actually not only see what the fear of man is, what it looks like, but we start to get a glimpse of what it does. You might say you see all of what it does in the story of Charles Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins had been a good soldier for nine years. He had a good conduct award and had been promoted to sergeant. But on January 5th of 1965, after 10 days of planning and 10 beers, he tied a white t-shirt to his rifle and defected to the North Koreans. He disappeared into that dark country for nearly 40 years until 2004, when he was able to leave North Korea to seek medical treatment in Japan. In September, he turned himself in to US military authorities. At his court martial, the frail, tearful 64-year-old soldier pleaded guilty desertion, telling the judge, ma'am, I am in fact guilty. Why did he walk away from his unit and from his country? He said he fled because he was afraid that he would be transferred to dangerous daytime patrols in the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas, or worse, Vietnam. Jenkins wept at his, as he described his depression, fears of death, and heavy drinking leading up to his desertion. He thought that he would be returned home, but instead he suffered under harsh conditions his whole life. He said, I knew 100% what I was doing, but I didn't know the consequences. Presuming a quick return home through a prisoner exchange, instead it was 20 years before anyone in America even knew that he was alive. Tempted by his longing for comfort and for safety, he was tricked into seeing his enemy as safer than his allies. Though a good soldier with a good conduct award, he had turned bad and found himself now trapped. And that's what the fear of man does. It tempts us, tricks us, turns us, and traps us. And we see it in the Proverbs assertion that the fear of man will prove to be a snare. You see, for the first readers, that word snare uh, would have brought to mind this technique used in hunting birds. You see, a, a hunter of birds was called a fowler, and in a fowler's snare, some form of bait, a bird seed or something, is put out, something to tempt the bird to come closer. But once they take the bait, a string is pulled, the, the trap is sprung, and, and the bird is caught in a box or a net. And that's a picture of what the fear of man does. You see, snares work because they fool you with something that you'd like to have, some form of bait that convinces you to go where you should not go. Maybe a sense of security 
of other or others approval or i mean after all acting on the fear of man feels safe in the moment safe from harm safe from rejection drawing us in with the hope of getting something that we desire but it's a false hope it's only the bait because like the fowler's bait it comes with strings attached promising one thing uh, to trick you into going where you shouldn't only to lead to your own harm as admiral akbar would say it's a trap just think of a bird trapped in a net a box or a box the bird is made to fly way up in the sky but when it gets caught in the fowler's snare when it takes the bait it gets grounded it is meant to fly but now it can't it's meant to be free but it's not it's no longer free to live out of god's design for it and it's the same with us you see, when the fear of man traps you, you're no longer free to live the way that you were meant to live. It steals your mobility, your purpose, and your peace of mind. After luring you to where you shouldn't have gone, you can find yourself suddenly carried away, delivered into someone else's control. We saw it at work in, in Jesus' day. You see, in the Gospel of John, we see all sorts of people believing in Jesus and becoming his, his followers. But as we read in, in John chapter 12, many who believed in Jesus didn't go public about it because they feared the rejection of a group called the Pharisees. They feared being put out of the synagogue that was so central to Jewish religious and, and cultural life in their day. See, like a bird that was made to, to sing, Jesus' followers were made to confess who he is before others. But they kept their mouths shut because it says, they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They were silenced, controlled by the fear of man. And fear can do the same thing today. I, I've seen it in my own life when I was in a, a Christian band and we had very explicit Christian lyrics and we got to play with the most popular band in our school. Somehow, like the lead vocalist who may have resembled me suddenly got a little mumbly on, on certain parts. The reality is, as Christians, we're ambassadors for Christ. But fear can make us hide who we are as Jesus' followers, afraid of what our, our neighbors, colleagues, or, or classmates might think if they hear or they see us as one of those religious people. See, fear of man can turn you, helping, keeping you from living out of who you are by God's design. In the scriptures, we read how we are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works, but fear can lead us to do evil. It can manifest itself in our, our compromised values. It can happen when we find no support for how we believe that we should be living, and so we find it easier to go with the flow than to rock the boat. It's when something else controls you so that you do not do what God commands or what he calls you to do. And the fear of man will mess with you in ways that not only harm you, it will harm others too. You see, it was fear that led Abraham not only to lie about Sarah being his wife, but led, him, but led her to being taken into a king's harem, threatening not only his wife and their marriage bed, but ultimately the lives of those that they had just met. And this didn't just happen once, he did it twice. The Israelite spies who fears, whose fear caused them to uh, bring back a fearful and a bad report of the promised land caused an entire generation thousands and thousands of people to lose out on the promised land. In our own time, fear of, of being fooled can lead you to judge others, offering you a tasty morsel from your pride to lure you in by telling you you're too smart to not see through their ruse, while leaving others feeling attacked and wounded by your words, your attitudes, and your actions. Fear of losing control of a situation can lead you to try to control others, whom you are not responsible for controlling, leaving others feeling controlled while losing control of yourself, the one person that you are responsible for controlling. In his book, Fearless, Max Lucado writes, Fear turns us into control freaks, for fear at its center is a perceived loss of control. When life spins wildly, we grab for a component of life we can manage. Our diet, the tidiness of our home, the armrest of a plane, or in many cases, people. 
That's why the fear of man possesses the power to turn us into beastly people. He continues, the more insecure we feel, the meaner we become. We growl and we bare our fangs. Why? Because we are bad, in part, but also because we feel cornered. Martin Niemöller documents an extreme example of this. He was a German pastor who took a heroic stand against Adolf Hitler. When he first met the dictator in 1933, Niemöller stood at the back of the room and listened. Later, when his wife asked him what he'd learned, he said, I discovered that her Hitler is a terribly frightened man, fearing how the world would, would be different if just one group were simply allowed to exist. Hitler's fear led to unthinkable suffering and injustice because fear releases the tyrant within. The reality is there's a lot of fear in our world today. Some is rooted in realities older than any of us in this room. And yet others are afraid because of changes they've seen in their own country over the last five to ten years, particularly how the way they see things is becoming more and more of a minority view. In a podcast discussing how to respond to these changes, Pastor Robert Cunningham uh, talked about the importance of engaging culture through the Christian ethic of love. Speaking about Christians, he says, Love is not dictating our cultural engagement right now. Fear is. When Jesus surveyed the culture, he had compassion on them, for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When we survey the culture, we are freaking out. And that fear, that paranoia, dictates the terms of our cultural engagement. He goes on to quote 1 John 4, where fear is contrasted with love. But he also quotes something from pop culture that explains what fear does. He quotes Yoda from the Star Wars movies who said that fear is the path to the dark side because fear leads to anger and anger leads to hate and hate leads to suffering. He goes on by saying, it's interesting that they said fear begins the path to the dark side. And it's true because you inevitably hate what you fear. Repeating, you inevitably hate what you fear fear. And so if you fear the culture, if you fear the culture, you will become, it will, the culture will become an enemy to be defeated, not a neighbor to love. Those engaging in the culture war out of fear of losing the culture, he says this, if you win the culture war and have not love, you have lost the culture. You see, fear of man will trick you by saying, you can't play nice if you're going to win and entices you to do the very thing that guarantees those efforts will fail. You see, in the name of influence, it can turn someone away from the very core Christian ethic into the very thing that it was designed to cast out. As the English author T.D. James put it, perfect love may cast out fear, but fear is remarkably potent at casting out love. Fear of man takes the all-consuming influence only a holy God deserves uh, to have over you and gives it to sinful people. It will tempt you, it will trick you, it will trap you, and it will turn you, leading not only to your own harm but to the harm of others. And if that's what the fear of man is, if that's what the fear of man does, how can we be free from it? Well, we see it right here at the end of the same verse. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. So what does it mean to trust in the Lord? Well, the Hebrew word for, for trust means to set one's hope and confidence upon, uh, to be secure, fearing nothing. In other words, it counters fear of man by setting one's hope elsewhere, by finding a different source of your confidence and your security. If the fear of man is letting what other people think control you, if letting that overwhelm you is what traps you, Freedom comes from letting something else, someone else, take that place in your life. Whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Whoever finds their security, their confidence, their hope, not in how people think of them, but how the Lord thinks of them. In his book, What God Thinks When We Fail, Stephen C. Roy 
tells a fictional story about a young violinist who lived in London many years ago. Although he was a superb musician, he was deathly afraid of large crowds, and so he avoided giving concerts. But after enduring criticism for his unwillingness to give concerts, he finally agreed to perform in the largest venue in London. The young violinist came onto the stage and, and sat alone on a stool. He put his violin under his chin with no, and played for an hour and a half with no music in front of him, no orchestra behind him, no breaks. Just an hour and a half of absolutely beautiful violin music. It was after about 10 minutes or so, the violins finally put down their pads and just listened like the rest. After the performance, the crowd rose to its feet and began to applaud wildly, and they would not stop. But the young violinist didn't acknowledge the applause. He just peered out into the audience like he was looking for something or, or someone. And finally, he found what he was looking for. Relief came over his face, and he began to acknowledge their cheers. So after the concerts, the critics met him and, and backstage and said, you were wonderful, but one question. Why did it take you so long to acknowledge the applause of the audience? So the young violinist took a deep breath and answered, you know, I was really afraid of playing here, yet this was something I knew I needed to do. Tonight, just before I came on stage, I received word that my master teacher was to be in the audience. Throughout the concert, I tried to look for him, but I, I couldn't find him. So after I finished playing, I started looking more intently. I was so eager to find my teacher that I couldn't hear the applause. I just knew. I just had to know what he thought of my playing. That was all that mattered. Finally, I found him high in the balcony. He was standing and applauding with a big smile on his face. I said to myself, if the master is pleased with what I have done, everything else is okay. After seeing him, I was finally able to relax. Friends, when we know that the approval that we are living for is already ours, we too can finally relax. You see, when that eagerness to hear the approval and praise and acceptance from people is properly redirected back to God, then it's no longer the fear of man that controls us, but the fear of the Lord. As Oswald Chambers put it, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. See, when that describes your relationship with God, you see the kind of trust in the Lord that leads you to care more about his approval and his ways than whatever else might be pressuring you, tempting you, or luring you in another direction. Caring more about what he thinks of you than any human crowd, seeking his smile, his applause above all, and yet the reason that seeing and hearing it makes you finally able to relax and to rest is because it doesn't come the same way as the applause of man. You see, it's a trust, it's a confidence, it's a security that's no longer based on how you perform before others, what you do, but based on what God has done for you. That's why this proverb talks about trust in the Lord, not using the generic term for God, Elohim in the Hebrew, but, but God's covenant name. Yahweh, which is translated with all capital letters as the Lord. The name that doesn't simply speak to God's nature as divine, but his character and his relationship with his people. Speaking to who he is, uh, what he has done, what he has promised. A promise to welcome you, to love you, to embrace you, not based on who you are and what you've done, but based on who G he is and what he has done for you in Jesus Christ. See, it's what God has done in Jesus Christ that's behind the Bible's contrast between love and fear. We read in 1 John 4.18 that perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. See, when we consider our own failings, our own, in, our own imperfections, our own sin, there is one person who sees it all and will ultimately judge us based on the highest standard, based on his own. It's the prospect of losing that smile, earning that frown and displeasure, and bearing the consequences of it that is most worthy of our fear. As we heard in the scripture reading earlier, the one to fear is not the mortal that might reject you or, or laugh at you or even kill your body, but the divine one who has the power to pronounce your eternal destiny. That's the greatest fear. 
and it can be only cast out by love, the love that's offered in Jesus Christ. You see, it's because of that love that we hear the promise offered to Jesus' followers, the promise that whoever comes to him in faith, he will not cast out, he will not reject. And when we hear his offer to cover our shame, to forgive us our sins, to give us his, un- his righteousness when we, for, when we give up trying to become righteous enough on our own, to secure for us the welcome that he receives, it can all sound too good to be true. How can he do that? by facing the things that we fear for us. You see, as Jesus was facing a cross, he experienced the rejection by man. He experienced humiliation. He even experienced death on that cross. Why? Because he himself trusts in the Lord. That's why he's able to do it. You see, in perfectly fulfilling the very thing this proverb describes, he in love offers those who trust in him the very acceptance, the very security in the Father's love that Jesus already had and that we deeply long for. The love of the one who made us, the, one of the, the love of the master, the only one whose opinion matters in the end, so that looking to him and to his verdict, we too might be able to tune out all the other voices. That's the one whose approval, that's the one whose applause, that's the one whose verdict should be overwhelming us. And if your faith is in Jesus Christ, if you're united with him by faith, the approval and welcome and security that Jesus experiences in his relationship with the Father is for you as well. That is the fountain of life, to be gripped by it, not the fickle opinion of sinful And as a result, your life becomes less like a performance to try to please a crowd and more like a celebration of what the master has given to you, a life that plays a beautiful song of praise and thanksgiving and obedience as it seeks to play the notes that you were made to play, a life that's no longer controlled by the thoughts of what others think or do, but by what God has already done, the approval and security that is already yours. And when that becomes the focus of your life, when it's the fear of the Lord that controls you, that's when you see the last part of this verse become a reality for you. So what do those words actually mean? We might read, whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. And think of those who were only looking to God's approval, but still suffered. We might think of Jesus, who trusted in the Lord and always obeyed uh, the will of his heavenly Father, but died on a cross And so here's what we need to remember. If we were to read this as a simple promise that trust equals safety in every sense of the word, then we'd be forgetting that no proverbs are to be read as statements which never have an exception in any sense of a word. Uh, They speak in generalities. They speak of what generally happens. It It couldn't simply mean that if you trust God, life will be easy because Jesus told people to count the cost of following him, to expect hardships. But when we consider the context of these words, then we get a clearer picture of what it is saying. You see that phrase at the end of the verse, translated kept safe, is more literally will be set on high, securely above the fray, above the trap, where, where birds were meant to fly, away from where you're most likely to take the bait, safe from the trap that the fear of man lays for us, from being tempted, tricked, turned, and trapped, it doesn't mean that rejection or threats or actual harm from others will never hurt you, just that they won't control you. That's the freedom that trusting in the Lord brings. As Charles Spurgeon put it, the man who is trusting in the blood and righteousness of Jesus may not always be happy, but he is safe. He may not always be singing, but he is safe. He may not always have the joy of full assurance, but he is safe. He may sometimes be distressed, but he is always safe. Safe because you no longer take the bait, because you've been given something better than the bait, because your appetite for the kind of approval and security that only comes with strings attached fades away when you're fully satisfied with the kind of approval and security and love that only Jesus Christ can give. 
Let me pray for us.